Hi, this is Jose Luis here at Parametric Camp, and I would like to welcome you to another video in our series, Advanced Development in Grasshopper. In this video, I would like to delve deeper into the topic of data trees in Grasshopper and teach you how to generate them and how to use them using C Sharp scripting. But before we get into that, so what are data trees? Well, turns out that if you are familiar with Grasshopper, you already probably know that certain components create information and output information in a way that has, uh, that is not just all the elements one after each other, but they are arranged in this kind of data structure that has the lists of elements that we are spitting, but they are grouped in this thing that is called branches. And each branch has uh, some kind of ID that is composed by three, four, two, or more integers that is typically referred to as the path of that tree. Okay, so this turns out, this idea turns out to be extremely useful because it allows us to give some structure and to organize the data that we output from components in a uh, more specific way that is not just all the elements one after each other and to somehow represent the logic of the operation that we are doing using this structure. So for example, here you can see that I'm subdividing a surface into a set of UV segments and it turns out that what the component does it, it, is it gives me as many branches as subdivisions in one direction with as many elements as in each side of those limbs with as many elements as subdivisions in the other direction. So it's a very nice way of getting all these points structured as in rows along the surface, if you will. This is very nice and very important when we then want to perform operations where we combine these items, where we uh, <clears throat> mix them together, where we create geometry using only groups of this data. And this is because most of the vanilla grasshopper components work at the list level. So if I were to, for example, interpolate a curve over all these points, what this component would do is that it would, in, it would interpolate a curve over each one of these lists. Okay. So if you are coming from a CS background, a computer science background, and you have no idea what's going on, you can think of data trees as basically a complex data structure that contains typed elements, so points, curves, whatever, it can actually mix them together, but that's, a, that's more of an advanced topic. And where there is some additional metadata in the form of paths that allow us to retrieve lists of data. So data trees are basically containers of lists that are named with paths, all right? Now, this is, this data structure, data trees, is very, very grasshopper specific. It's not part of the standard C sharp specification. So if you're writing vanilla C sharp, you don't have access to data trees. It's a grasshopper thing. It's actually not even a rhino thing. It's a very grasshopper specific thing, uh, but it turns out to be very useful. Now, I'm not gonna get into the details of data trees, how they work, what they are, whatever, but because I have another video where I explain them in details, in detail in my series, Introduction to Parametric Modeling. So if you want to learn more about data trees and how, what their components and why they're in interesting, you may want to check the card that will be popping up somewhere here or check the link in the description of this video. What I would like to teach you in this video is now how to create data trees using C Sharp scripting and how to take data trees as inputs and manipulate them, okay? So let's take a look then at um, a couple of examples to illustrate this. All right, so the first example that we're going to do is going to be something super simple. What we're going to do is we're going to create a grid of points in a horizontal plane. Um, and I have already created some code that allows me to do that. So from starting from a point that I have drawn in Rhino and that I drag into Grasshopper, I have written offline this component that allows me to choose how many elements in one direction, how many elements in the other direction, and their distance. And the code looks something like this. You create, we create a list of points, and then we use a nested double for loop 
to compute the coordinates of each one of the points based on the original and then we create the point and we add it to the list. Don't worry, I'm going to write this again with us. Um, it's just that this would be the standard way where that we would use to output a single flat list of all those points together using the standard list structure that is available in C Sharp. Okay? And the result is what we could expect, all the points one after the other. But what we don't get is this nice arrangement of having each one of the points uh, sorted by um, sorted by row or sorted by column inside of the data tree, which is what we're going to try to do now. So what I'm going to do is, and you need to remember that when you do this, you need to type the input. So S is going to be a point 3D, a number of elements in the X direction is an integer, distance between elements in the x direction is a double. You know how this works already. Okay, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to copy paste this component. I'm going to uh, uh, and I'm going to I'm going to rewrite the code from scratch. Okay, so how would we rewrite this so that instead of outputting a flat list of points, we can output a data tree with some structure to how those points are contained in the tree. So let's let's follow. So if you remember in the previous X in the previous example, what we did was we created a list of points that we then added points to. So what we're going to do here is it's going to be similar, but instead of using a plain list, we're going to use a data tree structure, which again is something that is available to us because we're living inside of Grasshopper. This is not even Rhino common. This is the Grasshopper SDK, which I will talk about in further videos down the road. But data tree is available to us. And remember that data trees need to be typed. So I need to say that this data tree has to be a container for 0.3D objects. And I'm going to call this PTS. And as we already know, I'm also going to initialize the data tree to be an empty data tree of 0.3D objects. If you're more of the implicit variable type person, you can do this as well, it's shorter to type. But when I teach, I like to be super explicit about these things. Okay. And then what we're going to do is we're going to write again the double nest nested loop. So I'm going to start with the for loop that is going to iterate over um, the it's going to iterate over the rows because I want all the elements in I'm going to iterate over the columns because it's going to, I want all the elements in the same row to be on the same list. So I'm going to start with uh, j equals zero. J is less than the number of elements in the y direction. All right. And j plus plus. Then inside of here, I'm going to calculate what would be the y coordinate for all the elements in this row. So double y is going to be equal to the, va the y value of the starting point, the reference ones, plus the distance between elements times how many elements, how many rows have we already, so many, how many columns, how many, uh, how many rows have we traveled already with our nested for loop. Okay, so that's one thing. And now inside here, I'm going to create another for loop, which I'm going to iterate i equals c i equals zero i is less than the number of elements in the x direction i plus plus and then here i'm going to compute the x coordinate which is going to be equal to the x coordinate of the original point times the gap between points times i which is how many elements have we already parsed in this for loop okay and this should be enough. So now we can say the point that I want to create P is going to be equal a new, to a new point 3D in coordinates X and Y. Those are the values that I just calculated. And for the coordinate C, I'm just going to use the same value of C of our reference point. Okay. All right. So we have the point here calculated. It's computed. It already exists in memory. But now we need to store it in our data tree. Okay. Now, the first thing that I could do is I could just say, well, how does that, how can I do this? Well, I could just type PTS dot, and you can see that I already start getting access to 
all the methods and all the properties and all the cool functionality that is available to the data tree structure. So you can see that it has some kind of topology description, it has paths, it has, um, it has data count, it has branch count, it has a lot of stuff, which we will see very soon in the next example. But the simplest part is to say, maybe I can just add data to this data tree, which is very similar to the way we do it in lists. So I could, what I could do is I could just say, I'm going to add this point that I just generated to my data tree. And if I run this code, you can see that um, nothing happened. What is going on here? All right, sorry, that was actually quite uh, basic. So I forgot to write here on the outputs that the output P needs to be equal to that data tree that I just generated. Okay, so the, <laughs> all right. So I'm going to hit run and you can see that what I get is a result that is actually quite, quite similar to what I was getting before. It's just all the points on a list one after the other. All right. Now, the difference is very, very slight. And it, the fact is that the branch here is now zero as opposed to zero, zero, which is what we get from the default component. What that means is that if I don't specify anything else, what data trees do is that they take information and then they store it in the default branch, the most basic branch that can exist in a data tree, which is the branch with the path or the ID, if you will, with the path zero, just plain zero, okay? But that's not what we want. What we want is some kind of hierarchy of paths where we want to group points depending on where they were generated along in which row, okay? So the way we can do that is that if we look closely at the add method, we can see that the add method has two overloads. One, just adding whatever data, but then the second one is adding whatever data in, it takes a second argument that is this thing called a GH path. What is that? Well, it turns out that paths, the GA path is a class that we can use to specify in which one of those paths, in which one of those branches, or in which one of those IDs, we want to store a specific element. And in order to do that, the first thing that we need to do is we need to create an instance of that path that we are designing and then generate and then store that in that path. So the way we can do that is I can going to go here and I'm going to say, I'm going to generate a grasshopper path element that I'm going to just call path. And it's going to be equal to new grasshopper path. And as I open parentheses, you can see that there's a, a lot of overload. So nothing, one number, a set of numbers or another path. So I'm going to go for this one. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to provide a number to define that path. So for example, here, in this case, what I can do is I can say, I'm going to use the value of J which is telling me in which row I am right now. So I'm going to generate, I'm going to use this. And then here, when I create, when I add my point to the data tree, I want to add the point P, but I want to add it to the path that I have defined here. And then what this is going to do is that if I now hit run, what you can see is that because I am generating different paths with different IDs, so zero, one, and two, which is the numbers over which J iterates, then it turns out that um, I get this nice subdivision of points loosely arranged per row. So you can see the first five points are these ones, that there's another row, these ones, and the third row is these ones here. And if I play a little bit with this and I move these things around, you can see that the data trust structure adapts to that subdivision. Isn't that cool? Uh, oh, sorry, my head was on the way for the list. <laughs> but isn't this cool, right? Let me show you another trick. So let's say we wanted to add a bit more depth here. What I could do is I could say, well, instead of just one number, I can give, I can create the path with a series of numbers. So let's say that I wanted the path to be zero, zero, J. So you can see that this can, or I wanted the path to be 10, 
15, 0, and J. So I can also do that. I'm not sure why someone would want to do this, but it's possible, okay? So these are ways you can create different paths. However, um, just for the sake of a little bit of optimization, you may have noticed that I created this path here inside of the nested for loop. Since the path is going to be the same for all the points that I'm going to generate in the nested for loop, then why don't we just move this here, out here? We generate one path and then we use the same path for all the points inside of the for loop. The result is going to be the same, but we're saving ourselves a few tiny computational cycles. All right? All right, so is that is that is just data trees and that is just paths in Grasshopper. Generating data that is structured in branches and in data trees is just as simple as using the data tree structure and then when we add points to it, making sure that the points are added to a path with a particular set of integers, 0, 0, 1, 0, 0, 2, whatever, that we generate beforehand. That's it. That's all it takes. Okay? Beautiful. Let's take a look at another example where instead of outputting a grasshopper path or data tree, what we're going to do is that we're going to take data trees as inputs and we're going to take a few looks at their properties, their uh, structure, their topology, if you will, uh, and be able to operate with that. Okay, let's take a look at that. So let's do it. So I have created a C -sharp script component that I've already renamed tree information and with the paint bucket. And I have added a bunch of outputs of things that we can uh, get, information that we can get from a data tree, such as the topology. You will see what that means very soon. A description of what's going on inside of it. Then the names of the paths, how many paths are there and how many elements are part of the tree. Okay, so it's going to be super simple. And then the input is going to be just something like T as for the tree. And then what I have done or what I need to do yet is first of all, I need to make sure that I have the correct type for this data tree. However, this is a really interesting question. So because this particular component, I want the component to work exactly the same with any kind of data tree, no matter whether if the data tree contains vectors, points, classes, um, uh, curves, B ref, whatever, I actually don't really care at all. I don't really care about what type because I want the data tree to work exactly the same, no matter what it contains. The information of how many elements, how many paths, whatever is going to be the same regardless of the type. So it turns out that in this very specific case, which could be called an exception maybe, it turns out that I don't need to specify a type because if I don't, then the input of T is going to be the default object type, which is the base class from which all types in C Sharp inherit. And uh, any, so that means that anything that I plug into this input is going to be accepted no matter the type because every single object, every single type is going to be a children, a child of this parent uh, root class called the object class. That's a very C sharp specific thing. I could alternatively, if I was um, very concerned, I could just click the, on the system object type, but I don't even need to do that at all. What I need to do though, is that if you have seen my input right now, T is just one single element. And we have learned before how if in order to change that, I can change the input access to list access. But if I do that, you will see that now the input is a list of objects, but this is a standard C sharp list, which is also not going to give me access to all the nice data tree information. So what I will need to do is I will need to instead go here and type tree access so that whatever information is coming in, is coming in already with the data tree structure format that Grasshopper gives me, and therefore all the additional information that comes with this data structure. So remember, when you want to work with data trees, you need to set the access of that input to the data tree type. 
And then I can just plug in, for example, this thing that was coming from that I generated before, the grid of points. And I can take that tree and do some manipulations to find out properties of that tree. So for example, how can I do that? Well, turns out that the T of the T element, the data tree, if I click, as we said before, has a bunch of properties, branch count, branches, data count, whatever. So let's take a look at a few of those. So for example, if I want to output here, and for this, I'm going to just do it directly. So item count is going to be equal to T dot and the amount of elements. So what is data count? Data count. Data count tells me how many elements, how many items are present in this data tree. And if I click, you can see that, uh, no, you cannot see it's giving me 15 elements, which is the number of items that are present all together across all the different branches. All right, very nice. What about branch count? How many branches are in this tree? Well, turns out that branch count is also very straightforward, T dot, and you can click here and say, you have access to the branches themselves, which we will see right now. And we have access to a number that tells us how many branches are in this Tree. And you can see that now the output is that I have three branches all the way in this data tree. What about the paths? Can I dump here a list of all those paths? Let's see if that works. So I can do paths is going to be equal to t dot. And then here in paths, we can get a list of all the paths. And then if I output that over here, you will see that what I get is a list of all those paths, which automatically get stringified to their ID numbers. Okay, so that's pretty cool. All right. Now, what else? We have the topology. What is topology? Well, the topology is actually this very nice thing, t dot topology description, which just returns a string that gives me a nice description of what the tree is made of. So you can see it's a data tree. It has three branches. These are the paths of the branches and each one has five elements, which is kind of what we were doing here more or less. Right? Now, something that we could do is we could manually try to uh, output something similar to this. Okay. So what we could do is, and this is going to be interesting to know how to iterate all the information of a data tree. So what I would like to output here in the description, my handwritten description is a list of sentences that says branch, and then the item, the branch ID, the branch path contains this many elements, five, six, whatever those are. So I would like to create strings for each branch. I would like to create a string, a sentence that describes that the path of that, the path of that branch, and the amount of elements that it has. So in order to do that, we're going to first create a list of strings, right? Sentences, and which going, we're going to initialize to a list of strings, okay? And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to iterate with a for loop. I'm going to iterate over all the branches. I'm going to get their paths, I'm going to get their information, and then I'm going to compose this sentence. All right. So how am I do that? I'm, I'm going to do that. Well, first of all, I need to iterate over all the branches. We know already that we have a property called branch count that tells me how many branches exist in the data tree. So let's use that. So I'm going to iterate over i equals zero, i is less than t dot branch count i plus plus and then and then here we go all right so now how can we actually get the branches well it turns out that t dot branches is a property that i can use to retrieve particular branches from the data tree and what's interesting is that internally those branches are stored in order so what I can do here is I can say, I can say from branches, I can use the array accessor to use a, to get an index, sorry, to use an index value to refer to the position where this list is on the data tree. So I want to retrieve 
the first list, the second list, or the third list. So that's why I'm going to use I, all right? And I'm going to store that in a list of objects, which is going to be the branch. Because remember, since it's a data tree of objects, then it contains branches, which are lists, so plain C-sharp lists of objects, okay? And then the next thing is that I want to figure out the corresponding path that that branch contains. Turns out that data trees also have this thing called paths, which with also the array notation, I can use to retrieve in order one after the other, all the paths that are available for each branch. So I have two lists, the list of branches, which contains this list, this list, and the list of the corresponding list of paths for each one of those branches, all right? So I can say, give me the path that is in position num number i, the first path, the second path, the third path. And what I need to do is I need to store this into a grasshopper path element. So, and this way I can get, so this R with this way, I have been able to iterate over each one of the branches and each one of the paths that make up my data tree. And now what I can do is I can just compose that string. So in string str is going to be equal to branch, white space, and then path. And just to make sure I'm going to convert the path to the string, okay? And then I'm going to, because it's going to get really long, I'm just going to say, well, the next line is going to be a, a, a white space and it's going to be contains, oh, sorry, contains this many elements. And we know that branch, which I already got, is already a list, it's a standard list. So it, we can use on that list all the normal things that we do for lists. So for example, branch.count will tell me how many elements are in that, in that list. And then I'm going to wrap up the sentence by saying branch whatever contains this many elements. And to the array, to, this, to the list sentences, I'm going to add that new string that I just created. And now for the output, I'm going to write that the description is going to be equal to those sentences that I just created. Okay, and I'm going to run this and boom. Wow, how nice is this? Oh, sorry. <laughs> how nice is this? Branch zero contains five elements. Branch one contains five elements, etc. If it was a bit more of a complicated data tree like this one, all right, we would see that everything adapts correspondingly. Three trees, three branches with these IDs contain six elements. These are the paths. These are the number of branches and the name, the number of um, of the number of um, of items in the data tree. Okay, beautiful. Well, I think with this, you probably have a good beginning to how to grasp data trees and how to create them programmatically using C sharp code inside of Rascopper script components. We will see very soon down the road how to do this when we compile when our own plugins. And also, I hope you had a good grasp on how to take a data tree and then manipulate the data in that data tree. All right. We're actually going to do a few more advanced examples on all these topics on the next video when we um, take a look at when we implement some data components in our in the plugin that we are developing in this series. Okay. Oh, 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 sorry, sorry. And I forgot to actually recommend. I really, if you really want to learn more about data trees, I cannot recommend any more Andrew Human's video called The Deal with Data Trees, where he actually goes into quite some depth explaining data trees, how they work, why are they important, and how they relate to geometrical operations. And it's very well illustrated and it's really well explained. And I actually, and it actually ends up, it doesn't get into the technicals but it talks a lot about issues of data matching and data lacing. And he actually ends up with a set of recommendations about like uh, avoiding flattening, avoiding simplifying and avoid basically destructive operations of data trees, which I cannot agree more with because um, 
as I also forgot to mention in the video, what's interesting about data trees is that they encapsulate so much more information than just the data itself, but the way that it is structured and in the levels of the paths is a way of inheriting the lineage of where that data is coming from, which is extremely, extremely useful when working with Grasshopper. So in general, as computational designers, the more information you have, it may feel like it's a little more difficult to handle, but that is a technical problem. And as soon as you go over that technical problem, the more information you have, the more power you can you, you, you have on your own and you can exhibit. So we want to have power. We Power leads to freedom. It leads to choices and it leads to a lot of good things. All right. So if you want to learn more, um, there should be a link to Andrew's lecture somewhere here, blah, blah, blah. And on the card or on the di <laughs> of the description. It's so late. Sorry, I've been recording all day. <laughs> a card should be popping up or the link should be on the description or both. OK, but I really, really strongly recommend this video. It's really well done and very nice graphically illustrated. Let's go back to the main video. Beautiful. So if you want to see more advanced examples, follow me on the next hands on exercise. Otherwise, see you on the next videos on this series where we're going to take a closer look at more advanced topics. OK, and as usual, if you think this content was useful, it's useful, maybe hit the like button, maybe subscribe to the channel, maybe say hi, maybe say boo, whatever, whatever you feel called to do. OK, <laughs> thank you very much and see you on the next video.